there's a huge probability that the t-shirt that you're wearing right now is made or manufactured or fabricated in Bangladesh, Vietnam, the Dominican Republic, Indonesia, or even the Philippines. Now, of course, this begs the question, wouldn't it be more logical if, say, those t-shirts that you're wearing right now is manufactured or fabricated in the country of which that company who made that t-shirt or designed that t-shirt is headquartered on or based on? The answer to that question, of course, is surprisingly no. Because apparently, as we've learned in our previous discussions, labor and resource costs in developing nations can, of course, be so cheap that many corporations in the developed world can save a lot of money simply by moving production overseas. So we term that as outsourcing. But why is this system in the first place? So the guy responsible for today's topic or lesson is Emmanuel Wallerstein and we'll be learning about the theory that was introduced by him in several seconds beginning now. Hi, I'm Michael C. Jamilan and this is of course the subject, the contemporary world. Today, we'll be talking about the world systems theory, specifically the world modern world system. Now, Immanuel Wallerstein um, devised the so-called world systems theory to try to explain the patterns he observed in world economy. So basically, this theory seeks to answer the question, why is economic development not equal, right? So the world systems theory then de-emphasizes the role of individual countries. So that's why it's a world system in the first place. Now, instead of the United States as a superpower, for example, you know, world systems theory emphasizes the global economic hegemony or dominance of the West in general, of which, of course, the United States is a part of. Now, the modern world system also downplays the role of culture in favor of the impact of the global economy. So, in fact, guys, you know, the global definitions, divisions, I should say, that define the modern world system's theory are very similar in their own way to the socio-economic classes conceived by Karl Marx, okay? So, you have the proletariat and then you have the bourgeoisie. Now, the world system's theory divides also countries into categories that we will be learning and talking about later. So, roughly, these three categories are analogous to our socioeconomic concepts of the developed, developing, and least developed parts of the world. But guys, the important thing to remember is that world systems theory prioritizes economic dominance over any other factor in its way of discussing spatial variations in economic development. So, let us begin then our discussion on the wonderful world of the modern world system. But firstly, of course, here we go, talking about feudalism. For some, the system worked, others felt like it was prison. Monarchs and the lords were the ones with the command. Knights fought the battles, the peasants worked the land. Right, so we are referring here to the time period between the early, say, um, 1900s, 1700s to, 19, to 900s, uh, to 1150, to the 1300s until the decay of feudalism in the late 1500s. So, the so-called modern world system that we know of today emerged, of course, after the collapse of feudalism uh, between uh, the 1150 to 1300, of course, in which commerce centered and expanded within the feudal system, right? So, basically, the feudal society or the feudal system talks or emphasizes the role of lands or land ownership wherein you have this so-called kings or the nobilities okay, who owned all the land in the country and, of course, being the owners of this land made the laws. So he gave an area of land called the fife to reach lords and nobles and the nobles, of course, gave some land to professional sol soldiers. So in return, these knights or the nobles or the nobility fought for uh, the nobles 
and the king. Okay, so, and then the peasants who till or work the land, okay, for the nobles and knights, in turn offered them protection. So this is how the feudal society works back then. Now, what ended the feudal times or the feudalism? Age, for that matter. So it ended up with a lot of factors taken into consideration, like, for example, the growing agricultural productivity at that time or the diminishing agricultural productivity due to climate change at that time, the rise of this centralized monarchy, and of course, the birth of the so-called nation states or states. So basically, like I said, the feudal times or the feudalism decayed or it ended in the 15th century BC. So, of course, it was replaced by mercantilism. And then, of course, after that, uh, we now have the emergence of the so-called modern world system. Now, the modern world system, of course, uh, as we have learned in our introduction, relies on economic domination. So, when we say economic domination, we have these economic forces that are pulling people, states, and societies toward, toward worldwide economic transactions. So, this so-called economic uh, transactions or economic forces then, okay, like for example, in the form of trade, finance, and so on and so forth, the so-called economic activities, okay, what pull together people, what uh, pull people and states and societies together in order to connect linkages or in order to affect linkages or connections. And thus, when you have these linkages or connections, it then paves the way for the creation of this global or globalized economy. So it's not only concentrated on, you know, say, for example, a specific region or North America or or, or Africa, or Europe for that matter, okay? But because of these linkages now, because of these um, transactions or economic activities that are getting uh, on worldwide, or that are going on worldwide, so you now have the so-called global economy, and thus it paved the way for the so-called emergence of the modern world system. So today, of course, all countries in the world are interconnected or interdependent with one another, regardless of uh, whether or not there, there are countries that are um, economically or politically isolated from the rest of the world. Okay, but regardless of that fact, okay, majority of the countries in the world now are interconnected or interdependent with one another. All right, so according to Emmanuel Wallerstein, okay, the new capitalist world system was based on this idea of international division of labor in that different regions or different countries uh, in the world are categorized according to the types of labor condition or according to their areas of specialization, okay? <clears throat> So say, for example, uh, you have the first world countries and then you have the second world countries and then you have the so-called um, third world countries. So as we all know, when we say first world countries, these are the rich countries, the wealthy countries, the so-called uh, colonial powers, okay? the so-called used to be colonial powers. But then again, uh, of course, until as of this moment, they are still very powerful economically, militarily, and politically wise. Okay, so we are referring here to countries such as Australia, New Zealand, okay, which are, of course, countries in the Southern Hemisphere. And then, of course, a majority of the countries in the Global North, such as those countries in uh, Europe, North America, okay, say for example, Canada, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, okay, all the Scandinavian countries, and of course, you have South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and then of course, you have that little country in Southeast Asia called Singapore. So these are first world countries. Okay, so uh, when we speak of second world countries naman, okay, so we are referring here to those countries that are more developed than the developing parts of the world, okay? Now, uh, back then, when we speak of second world countries, this usually refer to those countries such as China, the USSR, okay, Vietnam, 
um, Cuba and all those former uh, communist countries, but those were the old times, ano, during the Cold War, when countries are categorized whether or not you are allied with the United States or the allied forces or whether you are uh, nine, uh, non-aligned for that matter. So even to the point that the Philippines used to be part of the first world, okay, but now when we say first, second, or third world, we are referring here to the economic or labor conditions of the different regions or countries in the world. And then, basing from that map, majority of the countries in the world do belong to this region or category called the third world okay so majority of those countries are located in africa okay some parts of south america and of course huge parts of asia including that of the philippines okay now uh, in our introduction earlier okay so we were reminded that the world systems theory are are, are is somehow similar with uh, the economic classes that were introduced by Karl Marx. No? So you are referring here to the, the existence of the proletariat and then the bourgeoisie. So like I said, the world systems uh, theory worked like that. Okay. So now, like I said, the world systems theory bases its explanation on the categories or divisions of nation according to economic dominance for that matter. Okay. So you have the countries categorized into three distinct uh, levels, okay? So you have the so-called core nations, so you have the semi-peripheral regions or countries, and then you have the peripheral countries, or we term that as nasa laylayan in Filipino. Okay, so in general, when we say core countries, these are, of course, the rich countries, like we said, and, and then, of course, you have the peripheral countries, so these are the poorest parts of the world. Okay, so the peripheral countries are right here, uh, of course, are majority uh, of the world now. So uh, we are speaking here of countries such as, say, the, the Philippines. Okay, and then of course, you have parts of Africa, okay, majority of Africa, okay, South America. Okay, Central America, and so on and so forth. So the peripheral countries, in terms of their role in the international division of labor, they mostly provide um, cheap labor, and of course, they are the source of raw materials, which are then sent, of course, to semi-peripheral or more often than more often than not to the core countries. And then, of course, these core countries are the ones that are the source of uh, capital. Okay, they possess the financial institutions, um, technological capacity, high technological sophistication, and then of course they have the means to exploit or maintain their their domination or dominance of the rest of the world via this means or factors. Now, the semi-peripheral countries, okay, straddle between the core and periphery in the sense that these so-called semi-peripheral countries are are uh, have uh, a substantial industrial or manufacturing sector but at the same time they can they can also be a provider of cheap labor or raw materials to the core countries that's why they are termed as semi peripheral countries okay so let us delve on a full discussion about the description or shall we say the functions of the each of these categories in the modern world system. So we start first with the core countries. Now, as we have already established in our discussion, so the core regions or nations try to dominate the modern world system by exploiting the rest of the system. Of course, like I said, with their high technology, financial institutions, and industries. So you have the traditional core countries such as the United States of America. So these are all marked in light orange right here. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, okay, United Kingdom, uh, most parts of Africa, okay, Japan, and so on and so forth. So these are the core regions or nations in the world. So remember, they are like the capitalists, right? So which reminds us of Karl Marx, uh, 
pointing to the so-called capitalists or the bourgeois or the middle class. And then, of course, we have at the extreme end of the equation, so you have the peripheral countries. So the peripheral are often colloquially termed as underdeveloped or semi-developed regions. So the peripheral nations, yung mga nasa nilayan, exist to, of course, like we said, serve the interests of the core nations by providing raw materials, okay, like in the form of minerals, agricultural crops or products, um, luxury goods, and of course, uh, the also the source of cheap labor, which is often uh, characterized as being force. Okay, so that's the peripheral countries. And then, of course, like I said, for the semi-peripheral countries, so they straddle between the core and the peripheral. So they lie between the exploiting and the exploited or the core and the peripheral area. So these countries, these peripheral, semi-peripheral nations as us, uh, China, the uh, Russian Federation, okay, um, India, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Mexico. So these regions or countries serve as intermediate uh, trade areas between the two regions, the core and, the, and then the periphery, while also possessing, like I said, small manufacturing sectors either for local or international trade, and some sorts of chemical uh, capital accumulation. And the semi-peripheral uh, countries uh, can also be providers of cheap labor to the core nations or core countries. Like, for example, China and India, of course, are often, you know, do, soft, do, do often send out their um, people, particularly its professionals or semi-skilled workers, to the rest of the world, particularly to those the developing uh, or the developed parts of the world or the developed nations in the world. Now, uh, when we speak of the so-called core nations or core regions in the world, okay, so Wallerstein introduces this concept or hegemony. So when we speak of hegemony in IR international relations terms, also uh, of course, it refers to those situations in which one static combines economic, political, and financial superiority over other state. And therefore, these so-called hegemonies both have military and cultural as well as economic and political power. Like, for example, exemplified in the cartoon there, the United States exists as the sole hegemony in the modern world system. But countries, of course, are trying so hard to be the global hegemony as exemplified in our next slide right here. So there are three periods of hegemonic domination in the modern world system. So, uh, so you have the Netherlands starting as the first hegemony according to historians and scholars. So they had begun their hegemonic domination of the world in the mid-17th century, okay? And then, of course, it was followed by Great Britain or the United Kingdom in the mid-19th century until their power has diminished right after the First and Second World War, until uh, the Great Britain or the United Kingdom was replaced, of course, by the United States, which had emerged as a global superpower, as a global hegemon in the mid-20th century, right or preceding the, or after the so-called Second World War. So, of course, um, it cannot be helped, of course, to emphasize that uh, power is uh, not an infinite thing for the matter because it begs the question on who's going to be the next superpower, who's going to be the next global hegemon. So will it be China? Will it be the Russian Federation? Will it be India? Time can only tell. So, that's the end of my discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, so again, this is the so-called modern world system. Until then, goodbye.